Ah, 2016. Remember the world wasn't a complete chaotic dumpster fire filled with plague and pestilence? What a time to be alive. In a small town of Shadow Canyon, or really just a small neighborhood of Shadow Canyon, basically it's a suburb in California, an outbreak of a disease would begin quickly taking over the planet, while the current leader of the free world will just kind of tell us there's no way any sort of illness could ever get a foothold in the United States. And man, I'll tell you, hearing that stuff now is always a trip, because we used to actually hold that belief to be true. But hey, that's life. As the pathogen began to continue to spread across the globe, it would ultimately make its way into the U.S., beginning in the cities at first. Then, everything was kind of relatively quiet, as there didn't seem to be too much information flowing around. But as it hit the small town, it becomes apparent. It was actually everywhere. Information was just being crushed before it had a chance to even get out by cutting communications. As a father goes to pick up his wife, he leaves his two daughters behind before getting caught up in the quarantine himself. But unlike Arnold and Maggie, who was a complete boss about it, this dad would never return for his daughters, instead just kind of, you know, going to another state. As the pathogen continued to spread, it would ultimately result in infected students and parents acting aggressively and attacking anyone who was not currently infected to fuel their newfound hunger as they were being controlled by this pathogen. Today's episode, we will discuss why the description of this movie is hilariously wrong, and I quote, Following the outbreak of a virus that wipes out the majority of the human population, a young woman documents her family's new life in quarantine and tries to protect her infected sister. Uh, first part's wrong. Second part, she didn't document anything. This wasn't a found footage movie. It was just literally a filmed movie. I, okay. Okay, anyways, it didn't document. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Like, none of this even happened, the absolute mad lads. But we also talk about the actual disease, what it's doing to everyone's meat suits, and why it inspires the aggression. And honestly, why this doesn't even seem like you would have that much of an issue in terms of actual spread, seeing as a vector, it's not really an efficient one. But first, this episode is sponsored by The Walking Dead Survivors mobile game. The Walking Dead Survivors is the official strategy game based on the Skybound comic series, and as such, all the characters like Rick, Negan, Glenn, and hordes of walkers are there for you to fight against, as well as other clans, as you build your shelter, recruit your army, and grow your reputation as a leader. But you better do it fast, as your shelter is under constant threat from the horde that is attempting to break it down and infiltrate your base. After downloading the game and playing a bit, my favorite aspect is, and always will be, base building against a zombie horde. As to me, it's always a good time building and thriving in bases as zombies beat on the fences. It really makes it feel like a nice island in a storm of seas. So strengthen your walls, place obstacles to slow them down, and build up your defense towers to keep home base safe. You can also explore around your settlement, adding to the area, growing its power, and collecting heroes that you can then level up and develop to come with you to fight on missions. Seeing as this is the official game as well, you can roleplay as any survivor you'd like, or have the ones you wish didn't get their eyeballs popped out, as they're still alive in games, such as Glenn. But it's not just the horde out there. Other clans are vying for the same resources, meaning you can engage in PvP and war games with other survivors in the area. Using the link in my description or scanning the QR code up on screen right now, you can join me in The Walking Dead. And using my special redeem code, you can get exclusive bonuses in game. You can download the game and try it for yourself, which is always appreciated as it helps the channel as well. All right, let's get back to it. So I'm doing something new. Apparently most people here actually just enjoy the breakdowns and then those who want to see the science stay anyways. So we're just going to launch into this thing. This will probably just be the new format from here on out. So let's Let's get to why when a disease of any sort is spreading, it's probably in your best interest to take standard precautions, which if you don't know what those are, it's assuming everyone is infected with everything at all times. And no, it definitely doesn't make you paranoid. I mean, look at me. I definitely didn't choose a career path based on me being a hypochondriac and then just accidentally end up on YouTube. So we start off our story much like any other movie that deals with disease, with a ton of talk about diseases. All over Earth, reports of some mystery pathogen are coming over the radio, and there is concern that Chinese officials may not have been telling the whole story as it began there. Thank God that didn't happen in real life. So America begins locking down the borders of the country in order to stop the spread, dealing with the political fallout. And here's the first example of, yeah, this isn't even a virus. They literally just straight call it worm flu in like the first two minutes of the video because it's actually a parasite, which is definitely not a virus. But the description says outbreak of a virus. Why not just call it what it is? Honestly, I think something may have gotten lost in translation here, but it results in a bloody cough, fever, and in some cases seizures, likely indicating that this would be a respiratory parasite to some degree. Though we will see later, it's not just completely bound to that area, it's just all over the place. They also mention how it's only spread through the transmission of blood, making it a bloodborne illness as well, or at least able to infect you via blood. So we start our morning with birds singing and horrible close-up of two kids rounding second base in a hallway as Emma watches on creepily. Now I remember high school, somewhat, and I don't remember kids doing like this in the hallways at all. Everyone was mostly just an awkward mass of hormones, but as Gracie comes up to Emma, she asks if she has any food. She's apparently hungrier than normal 
normal. But then again, when are teenagers not hungry? My sister and I actually went to visit my brother in Colorado a few months ago, and it about broke the freaking bank with all the food I had to go buy. So Gracie continues talking about how she's still hungry, but I mean, she also mentions how she just polished off like double stuffed Oreos. I mean, that's not very nutritious, so I think I'd be hungry too. Meanwhile, in biology class, they're dissecting toads. Fun fact, I took human anatomy courses back in high school, and we had to dissect a whole cat. Having a cat myself, it was a little sad, but uh, you learned a lot of mammalian structures that way. Emma now gets a call from Lucifer, which turns out to be her sister Stacy, and goes to help her before school ends, and then they all head outside. Emma now meets Stacy's boyfriend CJ as Evan hangs out against the bus like a cool guy back there, and Stacy offers him a ride, knowing Emma has the hots for Evan. As they ride back in awkward silence, because remember, raging hormones, the mom has a meeting in Kansas City, but should be back later that week. The dad says I love you, and the mom just straight up ignores it, fatality, and as the dad finally turns on the radio to break up the freaking monotony of silence. The sister then texts a bunch of crap, like she always tends to do, but now we see the most unbelievable part of this movie, or maybe it's just sad part because we're in reality, you be the judge. Houses in Shadow Canyon in California are starting at $175,000 for like a four bedroom house with a three car garage. Bro, we need to go back. Later that night, Gracie is talking to Emma over, I don't know, it's probably Skype because it's back then, as they're watching some dude in China cough blood all over a woman's face and baby. While Gracie just mentioned that her mom was actually coughing in her face all day. Yes, definitely nothing to be concerned about there, moving on. But as they talk, Emma gets a paper airplane through her window with a frog drawing. She looks out and it's lover boy out there and she says, call me, then writes down her phone number and throws it back. Hopefully their young love doesn't horribly end, but I guess we'll find out. So here's what I don't get. Emma then heads outside, which why not just give him the note yourself rather than throwing it? But now Evan's intoxicated stepfather walks out and as Emma makes the first move on Evan, it now pretty much cements that they're together. As she walks in, there's a green screen thing on the TV that looks really bad. I mean, if you look closely at that, it looks terrible. Emma and her old man have a heart to heart and the next day they're watching something about bot flies. The dad is talking about the illness going around and how they suspect it's actually a parasite and not a virus. Although he suspects it's single cell, but we will find out probably they're all wrong. That said, he begins talking about my personal favorite parasite, Toxoplasmosis gondii, but as the teacher talks, Gracie begins coughing up a bit of blood and then runs out of the room. Emma's dad then sends her to go check on her. As Emma walks around whispering in a school for some reason, I mean, it's a hallway, there's no need to whisper. She goes into the bathroom, but she's not there. She then heads outside and sees Gracie convulsing on the ground. As she runs over, another student does so as well to help. Emma then runs to go get the nurse as the other student has Gracie just cough blood all over his face and mouth, which is literally my nightmare. Other people's blood, like I can see blood, don't touch me with it. Emma gets checked out by the school nurse and probably just gets a bag of ice and a 10 minute nap, but Emma tells the nurse that Gracie's mom just got back from San Francisco yesterday. Since then, her throat has been hurting and she's been really hungry. The dad now leaves to go pick up the mom from the airport as families are packing up and getting ready to throw deuces. Emma looks up on the computer about the mutating strain of worm, which I, I don't know, I don't think it's really a mutating strain of worm, but she calls Gracie but gets no answer. Then Emma looks out and sees a random deer that has nothing to do with anything, by the way, before a helicopter flies way too close over her head with humanitarian aid. The dad then calls back and tells the daughters that the whole county is under quarantine at this point and he can't get back. So now we get an address from Obama telling us there's no evidence to suggest human to human transmission and there's no reason to start panicking yet. Oh wait, we already know how that turns out. Never forget, all it takes is 140 characters to completely trash your reputation and look like the biggest group of idiots known to man. Shade aside, they're all talking about containing the outbreak, but they need to take more aggressive steps to mitigate it. As Emma goes to the kitchen, she begins hearing a clicking noise and then goes to check the front door to see what that was. As she looks through the mail slot, she sees someone at the front door run by. As Stacy goes to check, she just straight opens the door, doesn't even look. Like, don't get me wrong, I get that she thinks Emma is being too cautious, but she doesn't know who's out there. She didn't even bother to check. She just instantly, oh, you're wrong, Emma, which is not a great way to ensure the stability of your lifespan. Bad things happen all the time. Never assume you're safe just because you think someone else is being overcautious. But anyhow, CJ then broke into the house and scares both of them, which still means Stacy didn't know that he was in the house, which means she did not know who was outside. Literally, she could have got got because of her ego. Anyways, so then uh, Stacy and CJ decide it's time to go upstairs. The next morning, Emma is awoken by military trucks moving through the town with some big nerds at the CDC, dropping off MREs for everyone, as well as disaster kits. Stacy gets a call from their mom, and she's still stuck at the airport. Later on, there's a report about infected people going missing, which, you know, is probably a little alarming as the disease is known to make people attack one another. So now with all that going on, we get the most teenagery teenage thing. So there's a disease that is actively in their town. It's been at your school. Everything's shutting down and the military is there. So what do you do? Well, of course, you go to a party. Emma was basically voluntold to go to the party because Evan was going as well. As she walks around with her mask on, most people aren't really sharing the same sentiment. So everyone is dancing, 
raging party at the end of the world, am I right? Stacy goes to look for CJ as he's ghosted as Evan and Emma go upstairs. Also, Mr. Edgy in the hoodie is the guy who got blood on his face earlier, who then went missing. As Evan and Emma pull back some plastic, we see the blonde from way earlier in the bathroom with someone. Who could it be? As Emma and Evan sit in a bathtub, he talks about how he likes her before hearing Stacy yelling at the blonde chick because CJ was getting frisky. Also, I want to know how this 18-year-old has so many tattoos. Like, I get like, you know, time-wise, it's not a big deal. It doesn't take that long. But how could you afford them? So in Smoker's Corner, one girl looks freaked out by the guy in the hoodie as he grabs her. Stoner Bro gets up to see what's happening as he turns around and then spits blood all over everyone. This causes the party to basically reach its conclusion as Stacy and Emma hide as Emma then sees one girl get grabbed and then we hear her get spit on. As Infection Boy clicks around the party, he manages to find them and then spits on Stacy, who has some of the worms crawl in her eyes. <laughs> Evan shows up to save Emma as the cops then show up to break up the fun. Actually, I suppose the fun was over at this point anyhow. Stacy goes and showers as Emma watches a broadcast on how nests are communicating and talking on some unknown frequency, which is pretty interesting actually. You social parasites. The next morning, the CDC has arrived to check everyone. Seems the process is a little flawed, however, as they check the neck and eyes, and that brings back no information, despite the fact that Stacy is absolutely infected. So now things aren't going so well. Their dad calls them to tell them basically lock everything down. The Chinese are wiping out their own towns off the map, as now they get a final warning of martial law being declared. Fun times. That night, flares start getting popped left, right, and center, like at Gracie's house. As Emma goes to text her dad, it's not delivered because the whole area is being blocked off from making calls. The military shows up to take Gracie as other flares begin being popped as well. Emma and Stacy now begin thinking that they need to basically GTFO, which uh, if you've ever played GTFO, I've actually done a video on that a little while back if you haven't seen it. Emma attempts to see if Ethan wants to come, but the stepdad answers the window and then closes it. As Stacy and Emma drive out, the military put up a restricted zone in like literally pitch blackness. Now, why would they actively hide that in the middle of the road? Why are they hanging out in total darkness? No idea. But Stacy does a smart thing and gets out after the military tells her to actively turn around. That's a great way to get your brain some fresh air, by the way. She says that they need to get by and get their dad, but the soldiers are becoming increasingly agitated, mainly because she's not listening to very simple and basic commands. Just remember, the military is not like cops. <laughs> Anyways, so a truck now shows up and tries to run the barricade before getting lit up. The next morning, Stacy's neck isn't feeling so good. The military drives by saying it's a felony now to harbor an infected individual. And Stacy is most definitely infected, having a little hole in her neck where the parasite is growing. That night, she gets pretty hungry and finally decides to spill the spaghetti out of her pocket about how their dad cheated on their mom. Real stand-up guy, it seems. Nobody told Emma because they thought that she couldn't handle it for some reason. And now Stacy starts coughing as someone begins pounding on the door, and it's our boy Evan. As he gets in, his stepdad keeps pounding on the door, but as Emma goes to look, it's almost like he knows that she's there and then spits blood all over the peephole. They then all put on their masks, although if these worms can crawl into your eyes, I mean, the masks don't really seem to do that much. Evan then takes the force multiplier as a stepdad jumps in through the window, clearly mega infected. Worms exit out of his ears, and they also begin clicking, looking for them. They operate on sound only, it appears. As a stepdad finds her, he takes one to the dome from Stacy, and then Stacy drops, coughing up blood. So now they lock her in the bathroom. Emma tells Evan to go, and he just says, nah, I'll stick around anyways. I mean, where's he gonna go? At this point, Emma goes and then tags her garage door with the same symbol in order to throw the nerds off her trail. Meanwhile, Stacy is yelling about how she's so hungry, and she can feel the worms behind her eyes wanting her to do things. She tells Emma and Evan that they really need to leave, but they're totally sticking around anyways. So she underlines a bunch of stuff in like a book about how to like get a bot fly out of your back. And I mean, really, she could have just read it and committed it to memory, but whichever. So as they head to the roof to take some selfies, Evan then shows up to talk to her. Emma resigns to her fate that she's not seeing her parents anymore, which may be correct. But out in the distance also, most of the towns are already on fire because they've just been straight up destroyed. And now her boy CJ arrives after cheating on Stacy, which bro, you know, I'm just gonna go on a limb. I don't think she wants to see you, or maybe she does. Because as he goes to tell her that the army has split and everyone is leaving, which that's never a good sign, he puts his arm in there to hold Stacy, and she just begins ripping off his arm and eating it like chicken wing style. So after walking in on that, they go and unceremoniously bury CJ in the yard as Emma resolves to remove the parasite. So they knock out Stacy with probably ungodly amounts of Z-Quill and canned chicken. Emma does something stupid also and puts her hand in there. I mean, I get the whole bonding thing, but you don't know what this parasite is capable of. Stacy now asks Emma to find their dad and tell her she's sorry if she doesn't make it. So after Stacy then passes out, the operation begins. They enter the bathroom and pull back her hair to find the hole in her neck. She puts some tape over it to suffocate the parasite, forcing it out as then she grabs it. But as she does, it activates Stacy's almonds as she grabs the rest of it and they start stomping it out. Well, that's a nice shock to the uh, central nervous system, which then makes Stacy pass out momentarily. 
Also, CJ said that the army left, but it looks like the army is like literally outside their window. So, uh, nice job on the info there, bro. So now things look better for Stacy as she starts eating the soup. Then overhead, we see the military is using heat signature tech to find that most of the neighborhood has now gathered in two central houses. Which, where's all the people who weren't infected? I mean, I know a lot of them did leave, but I'm kind of wondering why, like, Evan and Emma haven't left yet. Like, I know there's mountains around them, easily walkable mountains. Just get some water and start hoofing it, man. So Emma now has a nice scary dream about Stacy turning, and then she hears Evan yelling about how all the food is gone. So that's not good. But they see Stacy going for a marathon run, so they decide to run her down to one house with all the lights off. They find a family in there. Well, Dad of the Year decided to call it quits early in the game with his family. So I mean, I can't say I'd do the same thing, but uh, hey, maybe that's just me. As they move through the house, they find a ton of the neighborhood is actually in the back room, all linking up with Gracie laying on the ground as she's apparently the patient zero nest. Now everyone is awake and chasing them through the house. Stacy is upstairs holding her head and Stacy tells her to end her as then she begins to change and Emma is forced to take her out. Apparently just that one worm in the neck ain't it. And I mean, if the cure was that easy, I'm pretty sure that would have already been done by now. So now Emma is basically an orphan and siblingless, bummer dude. So then they burst out onto the roof to get away from everyone else. And as they look over to the next neighborhood and spot the military concussively blasting neighborhoods, that's probably probably not going to be good for their life expectancy. Then they spot one of them is literally heading towards them. They then jump into the pool as the whole area is engulfed in flames. They head back out of the pool and the entire neighborhood has been destroyed. Walking out of town, oh look, military equipment left behind. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. Emma then finds a picture of the family telling them to meet at Uncle Peter's, indicating that actually they did make it. So now they head to Washington State, which is a pretty good drive through an infected wasteland. And honestly, I would like to see a viral too, as this was a pretty cool movie, but it's still definitely not a virus. So first things first, worm flu, as I've complained about several times, is, as I just said, isn't a virus. So that being said, while a single cell larval parasite is in fact a eukaryotic cell, it is also larger than a virus, but that doesn't mean in some of the earliest stages it doesn't act similar to a virus in some capacity. Now it's really more in relation to how our body deals with the parasitic infection than the actual function of the parasite, because parasites are not invading your cells and replicating themselves using cellular and internal structures and mechanisms. Instead, I would say drifting through your body still nutrients along the way and altering your behavior. Now I do believe there is a specific parasite that this creature is related to, but I don't want to spill the beans immediately because Susan requests that the people watch these videos for longer, so it's time to get into some science. I think the first place we should start is the actual life cycle of this pathogen, seeing as there are quite a few distinct stages before moving on to the discussion about their eusocial behavior and how this affects the central nervous system. As these things are clearly able to operate the human body like a meat mech and turn them quite aggressive should the need arise. However, they also seem incredibly focused on obtaining outside nutrition, which appears to be something of a new trick as usually this is just a byproduct concerning parasitic actions and survival. Now, where does this whole thing start? Well, as the father mentioned previously, the parasite at the beginning was believed to be a single-celled organism infecting people. Now, parasites like this exist all over. In fact, there's a brain-eating parasite in most of the lakes in the southern United States and in the coastal regions known as Negleria phalari, which I just annoyed my wife for about two weeks with because I recently got lake water up my nose and then had and allergies coincide with what was happening, leading me to spiral thinking I had a brain-eating amoeba. So I'll tell you, that was a blast. But these particular parasites are single-celled and will enter through the nasal passages before following the nerves to the olfactory bulb and then consuming the rest of your brain. Well, attempting to anyhow. Because you see, your body goes nuclear freak-out mode concerning the immune response, and when the body isn't able to control the infection, this leads to something horrible known as primary amoebic meningioencephalitis, which basically means your brain is swelling while your meninges are swelling, so everything's putting pressure on your brain brain, which can lead to seizures, lack of awareness, coma, and eventually you will meet your end. But the point is, single-celled organisms like this do exist already in the world, but their infection rate is incredibly low. So low that since 2011, only 33 people in the United States have actually been infected. And this is from like the millions of exposures. So I don't tell you this to freak you out or anything, but it's important to know your enemy. The thing I would like to point out is single-celled parasitic infections by themselves have a huge range of infectivity. What we see in viral is something that is well outside the normal range range of what we could expect a parasite to infect by. Because believe it or not, compared to this movie, by again comparison, parasites would not be as great at spreading over this wide of a range and vast of an area. I mean, it could maybe do it if it was waterborne and everyone was taking virtually zero precautions. But once identified, however, parasites are usually overcome rather quickly. Because of this, the parasite in viral would need to do something deviating from the typical parasitic behavior, but not something that is wholly unheard of. I would direct you once again, Again, towards my favorite parasite, Toxoplasmosis gondii. I actually did my senior seminar paper over this parasite to obtain my degree, 
because it's absolutely fascinating to think about. What toxoplasmosis does is control the central nervous system by entering the brain itself, but not inspiring a nuclear option scenario with the immune system. In fact, it may calm the immune system of rodents in order to live within them. Once entering the brain, it will alter the behavior of rodents to their own detriment. How it does this is by affecting the neural tissue itself and decreasing communication in some areas associated with fear and anxiety, which would be the amygdala, and it does this by forming cysts within the brain, or at least lesions. This stops the mouse from being afraid of the smell of cats, but the parasite will continue to the point of the mouse becoming actually sexually attracted to the smell of cat urine. By doing so, this would cause the rodent to approach areas where cats have been or move out into the open where birds of prey are. This will inevitably spark an interaction where the mouse would be eaten. From here, toxoplasmosis will go on to reproduce in its primary host if it's eaten by a cat or just continue through the digestive system of a bird of prey. And then they are excreted out via waste, which other rodents will then find and start the process all over again. But this is all predicated on eggs being eaten by the correct animal for this process to function properly. Now, where it gets complicated is when humans get involved. If you have outdoor cats, and this is just for your information, if you're pregnant or your significant other is pregnant, you should never let them scoop cat boxes as this can make them become infected with toxoplasmosis which could result in the child expiring. But when it comes to our regular brains, we can also be infected and it will make us do the exact same thing. Not expire, but really like cats. People will become attracted to the scent of cat urine or in general, just not mind it as much. This may also make a person start hoarding cats, which may be the crazy cat lady down the street. Legitimately, the person may actually have parasites in their brain altering their behavior. And if you think you're safe, guess again. I know, I'm just hitting you with all the worst facts today. In the US, 11% of the population has been infected at some point six years and older and in the world this is as high as 60 percent so it's an incredibly common parasitic infection mainly because of our love for cats but your body typically clears it on its own without too much detriment now as a single-celled organism it's much easier to move into a host but toxoplasmosis does not turn into what we see in viral it will remain single cell throughout its life cycle never changing into a worm-like creature that we see which let's hit up the next stage of its life cycle shall we we see when stacy gets spit on this appears to be the point where the disease disease has entered the respiratory system, such as the lungs and trachea, in a large enough capacity to be infective. In the blood, likely the parasite is single-celled floating around the body or a very, very small multicellular organism. But after a few days has passed and the person continues eating and fueling the new growths, they will likely turn into the larval worms. Here they will enter the lungs, likely chewing their way through the tissue into the alveolar sacs, as these are easily accessible from the circulatory system, and then further up into the bronchi, and then lie in wait. As they continue to grow and amass in the lungs, this would cause the host to begin coughing up blood as, well, you know, now there's holes in their lung tissue. From here, things rapidly progress. As a person begins feeling unwell, their drive to eat would still be rather high, likely by the other smaller forms of the parasite within the bloodstream, ransacking nutrition and growing. But also the larval worms within the lungs are doing the same thing. This would inspire the host to eat more and more to fuel them, growing the parasite faster. Eventually, this continued growth would annoy the lung tissue to the point that coughing would become pretty standard, ejecting more of the parasite However, the parasite isn't like a virus or bacteria. It cannot just be sprayed out and drift through the air. Direct contact with bodily fluid is necessary for its propagation. Because of this, there likely must be some sort of trigger shortly after the seizure process where it infects others. So what it looks like to me is when the seizure happens, that's when the worm is officially in a larger control of the mind, or at least the body, as either the multicellular parasites have either bypassed the blood-brain barrier, entered the cerebral spinal fluid, or entered the brain in some sort of capacity, or there is the adult version of the parasite on the body that has begun knocking the host out of conscious commission, which I believe really it's probably a combination of all three. There's a reason for this, but to get there, we must first wrap up its second stage of the life cycle. When the seizure stage has happened, the body is now under control of the parasite. As this happens, the younger larval forms in the lungs are primed and ready to rock. Upon finding another person who is uninfected, a spasm in the diaphragm and contraction of the intercostal muscles would take place, pushing air out more forcibly than normal from the lungs, and this would bring up with it blood and worms. These adolescent worms will then crawl either into the eyes of the person or have already entered the mouth infecting them, but we can also assume, considering there is blood in the lungs and the more multicellular small forms that are in the blood, likely the blood itself does also have the parasite. Now, where does this violent spasm come from? Well, getting to the adult stage, we actually see what's happening concerning this parasite, or at least its late stage. After entering the body, the parasite will continue to grow within that body, likely contain 
contained within the blood that was spit on by the person. Smaller versions of the parasite also exist in the bloodstream as said. It appears as though one dominant adult, however, would take control or a larger control of the body. Moving around to the back of the neck, just above the thoracic vertebrae and at the bottom of the cervical vertebrae, the parasite will sit and continue to grow. It seems at this point, it will begin tapping into the spinal cord itself where everything at this point goes wrong. Interacting with the spinal cord, at first it can control the body in some ways, but the host will still resist the input of the parasite if the emotional bond with another is strong enough, such as with Stacy and Emma. However, should the emotional bond just not be there, such as with Stacy and CJ, parasite can override what the host wants to do, forcing them to eat anything if they haven't eaten in a while, leading to things like cannibalism. When it comes to infecting others, the parasite would be able to manipulate the spinal cord via likely pressure, causing a massive contraction of the diaphragm, and again, intercostal muscles, and I believe this shows the parasite to some degree does have control over that spinal cord function. Now, before getting too far ahead, I can hear you saying, well, Roanoke, why isn't the body actually doing something about this? Well, let's discuss my favorite topic to ruin everyone's day. So we actually need parasites, it turns out. There is evidence to suggest that allergies in the first world countries are becoming worse because we lack parasites in our diet. Parasites are known to have calming effects on our immune systems, and without them, our immune systems can become overactive. And that's the key point. They can literally calm our immune systems in some capacity to not attack them as readily. I believe this particular parasite is most definitely lulling our immune systems into a more docile state. But even if it's not, something you need to know about parasites are, our bodies are really not that adept at dealing with them. Regularly, parasites completely sidestep our immune system as they are just faster than our eosinophils and neutrophils, or when it comes down to our neutrophils, they could just completely rip them apart, such as with Negleria phalari. The point is, parasites are just jerks, but we need them for the time being until we learn how to take the effects that parasites have on our bodies and create something that we don't need the parasites for, but will still allow our bodies to exist as such. So, moving on. The typical input by the adult parasite, though, is to find the uninfected and spit on them, infecting them with their young. So we see when Stacy takes the parasite out of her neck, the adult was several feet in length, or roughly about one meter. This would be wrapped around her brainstem and spinal cord and likely also go up into her skull in some capacity, but also up into her eustachian tubes, which run to drain your ears. So ripping that out of your neck, if it's wrapped around all that stuff, oh, that's gotta be bad. But using the eustachian tubes is interesting as it can actually enter the middle ear and reside here, waiting for sound to be picked up, which it can use to hunt. We see the adult does not have full access to the brain or an understanding of what signals mean concerning chemoelectric signals from neuron to neuron, as the eyes are just virtually never used. In fact, the host is rendered blind late in the infection process, which we will discuss why that is. But we see with Evan's stepdad that his eyes have completely glazed over, and we hear Stacy talk about how she feels the parasites behind her eyes. Well, this is proof to me that the multicellular, smaller version of the parasite are still all over the body and in the brain altering the behavior, even though she is infected with an adult who seems to be controlling things from her neck. So the point of this is removing the parasite did very little besides removing one point of control. But considering what comes out of Stacy's mouth later, other adult parasites would have likely been able to take its place after removal. They just hadn't gotten there yet. Once detecting a noise using the mechanical sensory information provided by the inner ears of humans, the parasite exits the ears and starts clicking. This would appear to be a form of echolocation. However, if you don't move, then there is no new information to display your location. With the eyes virtually destroyed by the parasite, likely crowding it, and with too many nutrients being taken from the eyes, this can lead to tissue destruction. And that means the worm itself has to use your body in order to hunt, but must use its own sensory information to actually complete that hunt. Which again, this says to me, once you know this, it's actually really easy to move around the infected. So internally, what is actually happening with this parasite? I can hear you asking that now, and that's a great question, viewer. Well, much like toxoplasmosis, considering we see a change in the behavior at first, which unlike toxoplasmosis becomes hunger, then eventually progressing into falling back on baser instincts with no recollection of your prior life, it appears to me that the infection takes a similar pathway. Lesions in the brain can alter behavior dramatically if you didn't know. By having lesions formed in the amygdala and mice, they can completely change everything they know concerning survival. Once infected with this parasite and viral, these lesions would show up slowly at first due to the parasites actually in the bloodstream that have now moved into the brain. Once here, this would induce hunger, which means likely these lesions would first form in the hypothalamus. As the hunger continued and the parasite reproduced, this would eventually cause more lesions in the brain until finally so much of the tissue was destroyed, the brain would be operating in eco mode and you would just kind of turn into an animal driven by hunger and the need to consume anything as the parasite is telling you that you're starving, which likely you are as nutrition you take in is being used to fuel the parasite, which in turn would cause more ghrelin or the hunger hormone to be released to keep telling you that you're starving. At this point, once controlled, what I find most interesting is, is not so much how 
how it controls you, which I mean, that still is pretty cool as it's literally pulling on your spinal cord like a puppet string to just move you around while your brain slowly withers and becomes more animalistic, leading to less and less resistance from your conscious being, but also how the parasite interacts with one another. It seems that there is a familial bond amongst the parasites as they will return back to a central nest of whoever started the infection. Its original Helminth is the one who oversees the entire process of infection as they all answer locally to her, making the species eusocial, much like ants are. New queen, or it could even be a king, we don't really know, would go out leaving the old nest behind and begin forming its own colony. In this case, however, rather than just moving dirt and laying eggs, humans are the ones that are essentially the colony. Being that they are social, this Helminth would needed to have actually changed from its typical behavior that we could expect from parasites into something totally different. However, as the adults grow and continue to take over the body, they too will increase in size, compelling the host to return to the original progenitor of their nest. Once there, the parasite will exit out of the mouth or ears and enter the mouth of the original host where the worms could communicate with one another. Now, what are they saying? Well, it's hard to tell, really. Information could be relayed about potential new prey, general health of the bodies that they are in, if it's time to just move on to another area for more food, things such as that. Which, considering the whole neighborhood at this point is infected, I would like to point out, did you notice that there were two houses with a collection of people, meaning that possibly a new queen or king may have already been created and set up a second infection process in the area, meaning that they too would leave on their own fairly soon. So we finally arrived at my last point that I would like to cover. Judging by what we see, how these worms affect human behavior, their life cycles, and what they literally look like. What sort of parasite are they then? Well, it's clear to me that, as I've already said, they're a Helminth parasite. They're essentially worms, and in this case, I would be hesitant to say that they're a round worm and are more likely a flat worm. Because of this, I believe that they are actually related in some capacity to a tapeworm. Now, there are some things that would need to happen for this to function correctly. The first is, tapeworms are not actually all that friendly if you didn't know. When another tapeworm is in the body, they will compete and attempt to get rid of it. They will also try to oust different species of parasites as well. Basically, they are incredibly greedy for the body's resources. For this species to work properly, they would need to become a much more social species, which after hundreds of thousands of years of living in our guts, that may be possible should enough of an interaction happen. But just know this, tapeworms will actively sabotage one another if they get in the way. Potentially, the ones that broke off from the standard tapeworm family were ones that were successful and much better at reproducing in this new way of forcibly infecting other hosts, which in nature would make them fill a niche that doesn't yet exist, which would give them an edge to spread faster and further than standard tapeworms. The main thing that supports this idea of them being an offshoot of a tapeworm is actually their life cycles. When you think of tapeworms, you probably imagine the massive several feet in length worm in the guts, right? Well, that's not actually how they start. There's actually an infection known as cystocerosis, and this is basically what happens when you ingest tapeworm eggs. They will hatch and the larvae are released. While they are still multicellular, they are incredibly small and as such can infect large areas of your body, such as your brain, muscle, and epithelial tissues. I'd also like to point out that the parasite in viral is suggested to be single cellular, but it's also possible that it's just really small, much like the tapeworm, and is able to spread throughout the body using the circulatory system. We can actually see this is the case with Evan's stepdad, who has the parasites all over his neck, just below the skin. Anyhow, once this infection has started, this has the capability to create cysts all over the integument system, which then can spread to the brain and spinal cord, leading to things like headaches, altered behavior, and in some cases, seizures. But on top of this, it can lead to swelling of the optic disc, affecting the eyesight of a person. The pathophysiology of the parasite tracks with what the tapeworm is capable of, down to the destruction of the body to a large degree, but also concerning its life cycle as well. Because of this, I personally believe it to be an offshoot of the tapeworm family, one that was more successful in conquering a host. And you know what that means. We actually have several medications that are capable of paralyzing the tapeworms. However, it's not 100% effective because in general, the effect is paralysis that allows you to pass the parasite. If it's wrapped up in your brainstem, then where does it go after paralysis? This may be why the parasite has not yet been stopped as medications that immobilize tapeworms are not as effective on this species.